I know if you lie to psychiatrists, you your nose grows or something. I think it's worse than that. <laughs> Welcome to the Backpack Show. What are we doing yes, today, Terry? What? what? We have a thriller author on. <laughs> I will but pretend I'm surprised. Shush. It's not for the reasons you think. So, Assassin's Lullaby, written by Mark Rubenstein. Is it Rubenstein or Rubenstein? We didn't ask. We should have. Oh, we didn't <sighs> ask. We're going to ask. Anyway, I just finished the audio version. It's fantastic spy novel. But I asked Mark here because before he wrote thriller novels, he wrote a lot of medical self-help books and was a field medic in the army, went to medical school, is a physician. I mean, there's a lot going on here. How he learned so much about spycraft, I don't know. But I want Psychiatrist to. as well. Is that right? Yes. Hmm. Oh, but you know what I meant to ask you about that? Show. We're terrible well, host. I, you are. Your mom is here. She can I'm, take you to task for being a terrible host. That is probably a good idea. Coach Woodard. Has something changed in the land of StreamYard? Oh, there no. we go. It looks like the backstage changed just a tiny bit, but oh. I don't know. Well, if you want to find out for yourself, you should start your own show. Go to StreamYard, cbrogan.net slash StreamYard. <laughs> you can make your own show anytime you want. You can. Yep. Um, hey, want to make a podcast? You can. Go to castos.com. Our buddy uh, works over there. That's kind of why we went with it, Matt Medeiros. And, right, but uh, if it wasn't easy, you wouldn't have stuck with it. <laughs> oh, my so. gosh. It's stupid easy to make a podcast and run it off that show. So castos.com is our podcast host. Hey, want a dot .online domain? Who doesn't, Dude. really? Go to cbroga.net slash online. Just type in the name Chris any way you want, and it'll be fine. No, it has to be all caps. You have to type Chris in all caps if you oh. want the discount. Right, I don't know course. why. Maybe because they have little Chris in all lowercase and he gets a Maybe. different one. I don't little know. Little Chris gets a different discount. Little Chris gets a little discount. That's right. <laughs> so go big Chris. Um, hey, if you want to use the search engine that's not Google to track down Russian oligarchs and their uh, yes. mafia groups, you could go to presearch.com and you could type in names like Grigoff and things and see what you find. If they're Pre-search. Googleable, they're doing a bad job. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. So. Let's grab Mark in here. We got to ask that very first question, though. We forgot yes. to ask you, Rubenstein, 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 Rubenstein. Oh, okay. I would have been wrong. I would have. So been wrong. here's the thing: I was geeking out backstage. <laughs> Didn't ask you, and I should have, which I apologize. Yeah, well, it means redstone. In German, it means <laughs> redstone. Rubenstein is redstone. What would your spy name be? Uh, I don't know. Um, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not supposed to have a last name as a spy, and your first name should be not yours. So that was kind of the first thing Carrie and I were thinking about was, you know, when you sell the movie rights to Hollywood and they buy Assassin's Lullaby and adapt it, and someone goes to play your characters and everything. There's a lot of internal stuff that you you cover. I mean, when you're talking about him walking through any old mall. He's, you know, checking reflections in mirrors. He's going in one door and out the other door and all that sort of thing. Um, are you, h- How would you think they're going to portray, like, just the really rich internal dialogue your characters have when you write your books? It's very difficult to do in uh, in, in film to, to capture that internal uh, ruminations and dialogue. On the other hand... Um, uh, a good movie really depends on action and on uh, the uh, external dialogue between and among characters. So I assume that a screenwriter, which, by the way, is a very different kind of uh, skill than novel writing, a screenwriter would be able to do that by uh, creating a, a uh, an intense form of dialogue between the characters. I've often thought that when it comes to novel writing and probably to screenwriting also, Dialogue is not so much what people say to each other as it is what they do to each other in words. I love how you're like, that's their problem. That's the screenwriter's problem. Yeah, that's their problem. That's (laughs) right. (laughs) Not my problem. I just write the novels. (laughs) So I think one of the things that struck me about it, there is a lot of action. So it's not like watching Assassin's Lullaby unfold, you would ever be bored. 
but there's so much to the craft, like so much knowledge that the protagonist mm -hmm. has. I don't even, it's like he doesn't have, we know his name, right? But nobody else in the novel knows his real name, except for I think one one person, but that's it. But so all the things that he's noticing and thinking about come from a mix of, you know, his, his background in um, espionage. And they're not things most of us have any kind of experience with. So how do mm -hmm. you make it possible? Like, how do you convey that much knowledge and training without making the reader feel like I'm reading a textbook from, you know, from some spy yeah. training outfit? That's a great question, Carrie. You, you try to keep it simple, yet on the uh, other hand, you try and just drip in enough detail uh, about spycraft, about tracking and, and um, uh, the, the way Eli Dagan goes about his daily routines. You, you try and drip in enough detail to make it realistic. On the other hand, you simplify. I mean, if we were to get into the kinds of things that the CIA and the Mossad and the KGB do, if you get into the really, you get into the weeds with that stuff, it could be very dry and very difficult uh, for the, the lay person to understand or even frankly to care about. So you try and, as you do, I think in any novel, you try to tap in to universal feelings, namely fear, um, worry about being tracked or, or, or uh, trapped. Um, you, you have your protagonist in situations that are scary to him and would be scary to, for instance, getting locked into an elevator. I mean, most of us, uh, even although we're not claustrophobic or even phobic, if you can create a scene that has a claustrophobic feel, the your the reader will relate to that and will understand and will empathize with the character. I think 90% of uh, what appeals to readers uh, about novels and to some extent in, in film also is the ability to not just empathize with, but identify with the character, to, to feel what the character's feeling. You can do that with language. You can do that visually. You can do that in any of a number of ways. Uh, oftentimes in, in uh, film, about which I'm no expert, but uh, they do that with music. You know, eerie music plays or ominous music plays, uh, I think primarily of the opening scenes of uh, Jaws, where that music plays, you know something horrifying is going to happen and something ominous and deadly is approaching. So you try and create the music with words. And uh, that's what you do in a novel. When I read, uh, I, I'm different than Carrie. Carrie's on, through the book, and I'm about a little more than half through the book. I'm trying and, not to spoil it, but I really want yeah, to talk about we, it. Yeah, <laughs> we, we don't ever like to give away anything because that's, that's, and by the way, Mark has like, I don't know, 11 teen other books too. And yes. two more already in the in the can for later. So we're Including talking about lots one, of but... medical self-help books and novels too. <laughs> and so novels. you can sort yourself out and read. But in Assassin's books. Lullaby. I hope I don't get a heart attack from all this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the irony. I did um, do a book on, on heart disease with the cardiologist. <laughs> perfect. On, on Assassin's Lullaby, one of the things I was thinking about is that when when you write a thriller, for instance, there's just so much about paying attention to the the action arcs. Like you know, you need things have to happen often enough that people feel like they're getting their action fed and mm -hmm. all that. But one of the thoughts I had was that like you started off um, with Eli going to meet uh, Anton Gorlov, and it, they have that first scene where it's just immediately out of character for him. So you start the book by saying this isn't how this man operates, That's and right. then you set him on this kind of, you, you could feel the emotional tension rise in Eli almost immediately. One, it's kind of interesting to start with that kind of emotional tension, but did you plot that the way that people also plot action? Did you pl plot sort of like the emotional arcs in this book? Well, you try to, I, I think the operative model or paradigm in writing a thriller is to have the reader ask himself or herself, what happens next? What's going to happen in from this scene? What derives from this particular scene? Is this guy in trouble now? Or is he, if you're, you know, I'll never forget. I was once interviewing David Mamet for when I, I had a, uh, a, a, uh, 
I, I wrote the consistent interviews for the Huffington Post for a number of years. And one of the people I interviewed was David Mamet. And he said, you know, if Hamlet comes home from school and his father asks him, how was school? And Hamlet says, oh, it was great, Dad. That's as boring as can be. <laughs> but if Hamlet comes home from school and he thinks that his uncle killed his father and is sleeping with his mother, well, now you have conflict and you have something that's filled with tension and suspense, like what's going to happen next. So in every scene or almost every scene, you want to have this sense of something ominous that's about to happen or that could conceivably happen down the road. And that's what I tried to set up in the very beginning when he's in Grand Central Station and he meets Anton Garlov and he's breaking his usual mold of never meeting with a client. He's a professional assassin and he's never ever before met with a client. It's always been done online on a super secure site. And the reader gets the sense that something bad is gonna come of this. And in, in a way, it relates to the title of the book, Assassin's Lullaby. You know, a lullaby is what's sung to you before you go to sleep. And Eli Degan is in the business of putting people to sleep. So uh, they're, they're, you, you try and get people's attention and have them relate to what's on the page and to have them form images and sounds and, and whatever uh, in their mind's eye all of which is consistent with what you're trying to convey, to, to use your term, an arc of the novel. Where is this novel going? Where is Eli Dagan going? What's going to happen to him? And what's going to happen uh, in his life and to the people he cares about, if there are any? To use the words of the immortal Jules Winfield, you catch Eli during a transitional period, I think is what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. But he's constantly giving himself really good advice and then not listening to it. <laughs> so how, how does that work? Like most of us give ourselves pretty good advice and don't listen to it, but most of us aren't trained and conditioned to do the smart thing the way he is. So mm -hmm. how did you manage to make that believable because it was like when he decides we don't know when when the book opens we don't know why he's made the decision to do this i don't know if we ever exactly know why but the fact that he has doesn't feel like out of character once we know him better it still feels as though it was a like he had to do it almost like he had to do it for some reason even though he didn't know why and that's well why he we don't says know he says when he uh, i'm not going to say the details of the answer to yeah. that because when he meets up with noah at the bar he, uh, his old pal from Mossad days, he does say he's he's got a theory why he's taking all these risks, but I won't spoil that for anybody. You don't, exactly. <laughs> but, but we're not, we don't have that kind of self awareness. But we don't have that world. knowledge, yeah, as we're going through. Right, well, most you're, people, you're a psychiatrist. Most people, most <laughs> why do we don't do this? know their own selves very well? Uh, we think we do, but we don't know ourselves all that well. Eli does realize that to some extent he's feeling guilty for the things he's done. He's feeling that there's got to be more in life than what he's been experiencing, especially since what happened to him more than um, 20 years earlier. And, and I try to bring that in in the novel, that there have been certain tragedies in his life that have impelled him to become the person he has become. And he is now at the age of uh, 39, soon to be 40 when his uh, when he's aware that his physical capacities will be on the wane when he'll no longer have the speed the strength the flexibility that he had at age 20 25 that something has to change and he, perhaps he's having what could be called a midlife crisis although a bit early um and and he's reevaluating to some extent especially when he sees noah his friend at the bar in this uh, place that he goes to after he's done something, um, namely after he's killed somebody. And he's, for the first time in a long time, he's feeling a modicum of guilt because he's uh, just made a woman who happens to have been the wife of, a, uh, of an Odessa Bratva uh, mobster. He's just made her a newly minted widow. And he realizes for the first time that this is a terrible business that he's in, <laughs> that he's really uh, in the business of uh, eliminating life and making other people who extend beyond that quite unhappy. 
But like Arnold Schwarzenegger said in True Lies, they were all bad. <laughs> yes. That is a point. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have a couple good questions from the audience, but I have one question I want to get to right before that. Again, I'm, I'm sort of like transfixed by all the emotional depth you put into everybody. So I found it interesting that there were a few flashbacks for Anton Gorlov, for instance. Uh, we, we learned that what, you know, how, the, how horrible his parents, you know, had to survive, the, you know, their moments with the Nazis. We learned that he was getting beat up, you know, to and from school and everything like that. And mm -hmm. as big a guy as he was, you know, you can't take everybody down, but he learned and all that. And so uh, why was it important to, inf to, to really inject so much energy? And, and uh, you know, a lot of people let the uh, uh, um, bad guys be pretty flimsy. Why did Cardboard you inject cutouts, so much yeah. brain Cardboard into cutouts, that? yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think that if you're going to write a novel that uh, people are going to relate to, you want even the bad guy, the so-called bad guy, has to have depth. And uh, to some extent, you want the reader... Perhaps to a great extent, you want the reader to identify with the bad guy, too. Uh, or as, as uh, Kerry says, otherwise you've created a cardboard uh, caricature of a, of a villain. And um, although I don't think Anton Gorloff is so villainous, uh, he has a certain nobility to him and a certain, uh, the reader can understand why he's become the person he's become. You know, in psychiatry, we always place great emphasis on early childhood development and why people become the way they are. So I guess to some extent that's infiltrated my novel writing. Um, I, I, I think in order to, to create a fully realized in-depth character with whom the reader can identify and feel something for, uh, you, you, you want to bring out aspects of that character's past that um, resonate with the reader and that make the reader feel some empathy or sympathy. And, um, if, you can, and if you can do that, even with uh, Irena, who is a young woman who he meets, um, there are reasons she's become who she's become, although she remains somewhat of a, a mystery. And I don't want to give too much away um, because there are certain things that happen that, again, are out of uh, character for Eli, uh, given the, the strange and horrific life that he's been leading for the last 20 years. Every villain is the heart that is the hero of their own story though so i think if you wrote the book again from the perspective of any of those three people you just mm -hmm. mentioned you're going to see events unfold you know largely the same chronology but you all have a very different opinion about like the goodness or badness of those actions coach woodard is asking why a thriller as a novel how did you make the leap from medical self-help to spy thriller i have to think it's because you like understand people and what scares us <laughs> uh, you know it, it's funny um when I was a psychiatric resident, uh, we had to present cases and I presented my cases, people I either evaluated in consultation or was treating in active psychotherapy. Um, and in so doing, I found that uh, number one, every patient had a story, a, a real life, living, breathing story. And when I would tell these people stories in the form of a case uh, history or you know, at a seminar, uh, I even went so far as to recreate the patient's dialogue. And people said, you know, when you present a case, it's almost like a novel. And I said, well, people live novelistic lives. They, they, I mean, what is a novel? A novel is, is about life. It's about people living their lives and usually living lives in conflict. And who among us doesn't have conflict? So I found the transition from, uh, understanding or doing my best to understand patients and in treating patients and evaluating them to novel writing and to thriller writing, because there too, every single thriller, every single novel in order to really resonate with readers must contain conflict. As I said before about uh, Hamlet, no conflict, no story. Uh, that would be boring. So was it Hitchcock that said that the, the tension comes from knowing the bomb is under the table? Absolutely. <laughs> Otherwise, just people having coffee. <laughs> Michael Connolly uh, once made the point. He was uh, at, a, at a, um, a presentation. He took a glass of water and he put it in the middle of the table. He said, well, it's sitting here. It's boring. Then he began slowly moving the glass of water toward the edge of the table. And he said, now I've got your attention, don't I? 
So conflict and inner turmoil and uh, conflict within the protagonist himself and between the protagonist and the antagonist is what makes for a good story. Storytelling is really the, the elaboration of conflict between and among characters. Annette says the tension and feelings evoking emotions love how you're describing novel writers serving the readers. She also said, knowing ourselves, what are the pros and cons of not knowing ourselves? And what do you recommend people do to know themselves better? Well, knowing yourself is a very difficult thing to do. Um, we are all biased in favor of ourselves and we, we don't... Um, uh, we use various defense mechanisms to to paint our every person is his own hero or heroine. Uh, uh, it's part of what it is to be human is to be is to be somewhat narcissistically inclined in, and to love yourself, uh, not necessarily literally, but um, so. What are the advantages of knowing yourself? Well, uh, that means you can make better decisions. The the disadvantages, of course, are that you can walk blindly into various situations where uh, you either get hurt or hurt other people. Uh, it's as simple as that. I think it's very difficult to know thyself. And was it Plato or Aristotle? Who, who was it who said, know, above all, know thyself? Uh, very difficult to do. Uh, we all have defense mechanisms. We all do as much as we can to present ourselves to ourselves in the most favorable light possible. We have truths about ourselves that we choose not to acknowledge. Absolutely. It's called they're denial. Because they're not, we, we, they're we not deny, in line with the people we want to be. We, right. we deny the unpleasantness of, of our own selves. We, we, we do. certainly do that. I know I do it. Michael, yeah, but you know when you're doing it because you're a psychiatrist. Well, you're I like, try. Stop it. <laughs> but, you know, when I'm not treating a patient, my meter is off. <laughs> <laughs> Michael says most villains see themselves as the hero of their own story. Does Mark ever start creating villains and over sympathize with them? Well, you sympathize with them for sure. Do you over sympathize with them? I, I do. I, I, I don't know if I over sympathize, but I, again, in the context of, of storytelling, I try and make, uh, uh, create characters that uh, will evoke some level of empathy or sympathy. In, in this novel, Assassin's Lullaby, uh, Anton Gorlov, I, I, um, I can't say I fell in love with the guy, but I could understand him. I could empathize. I could feel for him uh, in a way. I don't, I don't want to give away too much about what happens, but uh, when the denouement of the novel comes about, I, I really uh, was very torn about where to go with it. And uh, uh, the, the tension between him and Eli Dagan was such that I, I really had to stop and think about where do I want to take this? And... Um, so that it, it retains some level of reality. Uh, it, it doesn't seem purely fantastical, but on the other hand, uh, I don't want either character to uh, to go the way of all flesh. One, so, one thing I noticed in your body of work is that you have gone all over the place. <clears throat> you know, there's there's often a physician, there's often, you know, something that kind of pulls from your background and all that. But, you know, you have... Uh, the Mad Dog stories, you have uh, the Tango stories, you have the Bedlam stories, you know, you've really, you had a Vietnam uh, war soldier. So you've had like all different kinds of uh, writing in all those directions. Your your upcoming book uh, after Assassin's Lullaby will be Downfall, which is about uh, people stumbling onto a scene where the main character realizes that it's a doppelganger of himself. It's, you know, a spitting image of him laying there dead on the ground. And then, uh, even more madness ensues. You don't seem to want to pigeonhole yourself too much to any one character or anything like that. As you're building your body of work, that obviously was a conscious decision. How did you arrive there? You know, it's funny. Uh, again, in the Huffington Post, I was once uh, interviewing Scott Turo, and he said, in his opinion, Every writer really writes only one book, uh, different stories, but it's about the same elemental mm -hmm. theme that may or may not be true when it comes to me. But um, I 
honestly, talk about knowing yourself. I have no idea how how I've come to these various ways of storytelling with these various characters in different uh, occupations or professions, a, a physician, a writer, um, uh, a psychiatrist, an internist, um, uh, a surgeon. Uh, that while there are commonalities, and I, uh, I think the only commonality is that I try and make every single one of these characters as human and as, as fallible as I possibly can. And um, beyond that, I don't know. I, I don't know where the next one is going to go. Um, uh, of course, as soon as I finish a novel, I start to worry, where's, what's, what am I going to come up with next? There's always this fear that I'll never be able to do it again. And um, when I was interviewing authors for the Huffington Post, I was very, very gratified to learn that even people like Harlan Coben and, and, and Lee Child and all the others as, as universally uh, admired and as widely published as they are, they have the same fears. So um, I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about Scott Turow is I've read one of his books and it was 1L. So for me, that's the one book for him. It's about first year law students. And I read it when I was a first year law student. And I remember um, being like, whiny. <laughs> I read, I read presumed innocent and i was you, you I, should I, read I presumed did. innocent and also another one innocent um and and in a sense scott does write a, a not the same book but similar books he is very concerned about justice and the fair and, and righteous administration of justice and that permeates every book he writes i suppose there is a theme that um uh that that penetrates most writers uh books i know for harlan coben it's the missing person you know what what is the horror of the missing person and and uh i once dubbed him the the king of the missing persons um i suppose in my uh body of work as as chris put it um the 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 penetrating theme may be the fear the anxiety the horror of not knowing what's coming next, that there's some horrible event that has happened and or is about to happen. And how does this impact the person? And yeah. um, you keep people guessing right till the end. I'm sorry. I was you keep people guessing right to the end. I was like one hour before the end of this audio book going, I don't see how this is. I don't know how he's going to wrap this up. <laughs> like, how is this going to yeah. end? I thought there'd be like, and continued like in the next book, but yeah. you did it. But yeah, right yeah. up till the end. There are surprises galore. Um, you never know what's going to happen with Eli Dagan and, uh, you know, what's, what's next, what happens next. And I tried to keep that going to the, well, if not the last page, the one or two pages prior to the very end of the book. And, um, uh, as as people uh, sometimes say, well, there, there's room for a sequel here. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she's a gorgeous woman on the cover there. Yeah. That that that's that's a woman who plays an integral part in the book. I don't know if Chris is up to that part yet, but um, I just met up her to, at up the to uh, party. A gorgeous woman. <laughs> I, I just met her at the party, so I'm I'm, I'm at the very oh, at the party. Yes, yeah. The te the teeter totter is just no, about. She's spoiling. a lovely ingenue. <laughs> Michael says that he would love to see you incorporate a character with a Brogan brand backpack into the next story. I would just be happy if, if you incorporate Brogan, like a grizzled business author who's leading a secret life or something. <laughs> It'd be fun. Coach, Coach Wardard says, when you write your novels, do you work from a detailed outline or do you go where the character or, or the action takes you? So is Eli in charge or are you? I don't really outline. What I do is uh, I have an idea. Usually it's a kernel of an idea that may come from any source. And I begin writing little uh, patchwork uh, paragraphs of uh, ideas that flow from that original single idea. And uh, then I start writing. And I, I think that for me, the novel is an organic thing. It sort of evolves as I go along. Sometimes I write myself into a cul-de-sac where on page uh, 80, I realize oh my God, this isn't going anywhere. I have to go back and revamp. And 
to me, the proof that an, uh, a novel is organic is that sometimes at page 150, I have a character saying something that is absolutely, totally inconsistent with what he said, uh, felt, or thought, or, or did on page 30. So I have to go back and revise page 30. And there, ergo, it's obvious that the character in the telling of the story has evolved and has organically become something uh, independent, in a sense, of me. Speaking of plotting and outlining and not outlining, uh, the, the usual... Uh, the, the, the usual take on this amongst thriller writers is that there are plotters and pantsers. Plotters outline everything. Pantsers fly by the seat of their pants. I'm sort of a planter. I, I, I do both. I plant, I, I, I do a little bit of outlining and a lot of um, just organic letting it flow and see where it goes, which is risky, by the way, because you, as I said, sometimes you find that uh, three quarters of the way through the novel, you have to go back and really do a great deal of revision and and uh, renovation uh, because you've created uh, in letting this free flow you've 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 gone way beyond where the character was at the beginning and you've created inconsistencies that have to be resolved. Especially because so every character in the book's life touches so many others. So if you pull a thread over here, something's unraveling over there. And <laughs> you probably had sure. to rewrite this book several times. Absolutely. If that happens too often. It can be very scary and very frustrating because there's nothing as, as to me, nothing as upsetting as realizing uh, on manuscript page 295 that you've screwed things up because you have to go back and really begin revamping what's on page 40. Otherwise, the book is just going to fall apart. So, um, and, 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 that, <laughs> that, that kind of, of, uh, ominous feeling brings you right back to the keyboard and you start uh, almost frantically starting to revise. When you like talk about your own adventure going back a hundred pages. Right. Right. And then coming back around um, again, I, you know, I don't mean to hang so much on the very beginning of the, the story, but like right out of the gate, the first meeting we see of Eli, he's going to go to this face to face meeting at grand central station. And he, he, the whole way to the meeting, he's like, this isn't like me. I don't do this. I always do my things remotely. So it's, it's, it's so interesting because it just starts with that tense energy right away. And you're like, why would he do that? And it takes you about a third and a half to get to where you find out kind of maybe why he is doing that and, you know, where his head is in this game. Um, but to your point about, um, going back and having to revise, there's that concept they call Chekhov's gun. If you see a gun in the first act, it damn well better have been used by the third act, or there's no point in having put it in there. I feel like you have Chekhov's gun rack in this book because you have <laughs> so many guns you're laying out there. Yeah. Well, Guns are, are uh, integral to thriller writing. I mean, uh, without a gun, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, you, you can have, death can come in many ways. And, and uh, I think you know already from Assassin's Lullaby that uh, death does come in various ways. Some uh, very imaginative. Uh, some are imaginative. Some are Mossad ways. Uh, I did a good deal of research on uh, on the Mossad and and on assassinations and uh, on the Russian uh, mob, which is, by the way, called the Bratva, which in Russian means the Brotherhood. That's the equivalent of what we know as the Mafia. And also what surprised me is that there's a Mafia in every ethnic group present, past, uh, and in the future. You name the ethnic group and there's, there is a cabal of criminals who, who uh, you know, whether it's the Dominicans or the Albanians or the Russians or the Italians or whomever, and, and uh, the Ukrainians, uh, it, it's just quite amazing. But that yes, surprised you? I'm a lawyer. That didn't surprise me at all. I was like, well, they're criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still practicing law uh, or, or are you a recovered lawyer? <laughs> recovered, recovered now, but like I could spot a cabal in a kindergarten class. Like, yeah, this is happening. <laughs> I have one last question and then we're going to ask you the question we ask every guest we've ever had in the show. But uh, you went through a lot of work. You went through a lot of training, a lot of schooling. You are a physician and a psychiatrist and a surgeon and all these things. I don't see the word doctor in front of your name anywhere. Is that, is that purposeful? in the way you're putting out your books? 
Uh, yeah, the only ones that have, and this is what the editor insisted on doing for Bedlam's Door and Beyond Bedlam's Door, which were nonfiction uh, right. psychiatry. They they insisted I put MD after my name. Um, oh, I see it. Those are the only two books that I that I did. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It, it it's it almost seems as though, uh, from a practical perspective, uh, having been a physician and a psychiatrist, it's part of another life. I, I don't even feel when I, I don't even uh, recognize when people call me doctor anymore. Uh, it's been so long since I've I've actually I've been retired from uh, psychiatry for about ten years now. So. Um, so you can't diagnose us. Well, that sucks. Oh, I can still been a waste of time. <laughs> I can diagnose everybody accurately, <laughs> but myself, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, uh, we, have, we have a couple of things we're going to do before we let you go. And uh, one of them is we, every episode we find ourselves a person of the day. Oh, and here's our person of the day. Kaboom! That's the voice of Tim Kitzrow, who did the video games, NBA jams, and... Uh, the other NHL NFL Blitz. Blitz. Oh, yeah. NFL. NFL. All right. Uh, I'm going to give it to Michael Doherty. Haven't seen my, my my friend Michael around here just lately, so I'll give him person of the day. That yeah, he and I were so like on the same wavelength today. Oh, for sure. He had a lot of good thoughts going on. Uh, now we're at that spot in the in the show where we, uh, I almost said the game, where we ask our guests the same <laughs> question we've asked everyone. So you are joining the ranks of Sister Anne Flanagan from the Sisters, Brothers of St. Paul, something like that. Daughters of St. Paul. Daughters of St. Paul. And uh, Mistress uh, Harley, who is a financial dominatrix. So we'll ask Montana, you. Mistress Montana, who's a regular dominatrix. Plain old dominatrix, yep. <laughs> uh, we'll ask you the question, what goes in your backpack? And this could be something physical, like a, an avocado. It could be something metaphorical, like a hope for the future. So let's ask the question. Uh, what goes in your backpack, Mark Rubenstein? I think what goes in my backpack would be a huge bolus of determination. Uh, when I first began writing, uh, uh, it seemed an impossible thing to get published. I couldn't even get an agent at first. It was, uh, and I must have sent out a couple of hundred query letters, which of course you have to include a brief synopsis of the novel that you're trying to peddle and um, never got beyond that point. But I kept going and eventually I got an agent and eventually got published. And, um, you know, I wrote, wrote my first novel when I was 70 years old. So um, it was sort of an unusual scenario. And um, I was intent upon and determined to, to uh, start a, another life or another chapter in, 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 in this life. And um, so I would have to say that determination and uh, maybe as a side thing in my backpack, I'd also put a dollop of self-confidence. You have to have confidence in yourself, uh, even though it can be very difficult at times and you can, it's very easy to get discouraged and feel you're never going to get anywhere. Self-confidence and determination are just absolute. You have to believe in yourself. And that's be careful it for while me. you're be careful while you're researching your next book, Mark. I worry about you. I don't want you like wandering over to some mafia guy and being like, "Can I ask you a couple of questions?" You know, just <laughs> psychiatry stuff. Don't get all uptight about it. I'm not. I knew, a few, I knew a few mafia uh, types growing up in Brooklyn. I did. <laughs> did you really? And uh -huh. could you do you still find them, or are they like? Gone. Oh no, I, I have nothing to do with them now. Oh no, 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 no. I'm I'm totally legit. <laughs> so Coach got... says wrote your first novel at 70. There's hope for us late bloomers. There's always hope. As long as you're breathing, there's hope. And and again, determination and confidence, not overconfidence, but just some confidence, and and you can, you know, you can keep going. And um I would even add a third thing, uh, just the, the willingness to explore, to, to uh, stretch yourself beyond what you've been accustomed to for all your life. Like when I was 70 years old, I had uh, for many years practiced in, in, in a certain way. I'd gone about my professional life in a certain way. And this was an enormous departure for me. But um, here I am. It's 10 years later. 
You made it happen. Unbelievable. Great answer, by the way. Good thing to throw in. Well, good three things to throw into the backpack. Um, I was thinking about the fact that there's all those, you know, young child prodigies who start at eight and everybody gets to feel bad. And you're like, oh, my gosh. I just saw a video interview with Serena Williams at age eight, realizing back then that she was going to be like who she was. And now you're saying at the other end of this, don't worry, you can start when you're 70. So I was just thinking through what my grandparents were doing when they were 70. And it was not writing uh, thriller novels, as it turned out. Uh, however, my grandmother did start an interesting career in uh, dance. The thing is, you wouldn't believe what kind of dancing. <laughs>